This episode of Basics is presented by The Singleton. I've partnered with The Singleton for our second installment in how to utilize different cuts of meat. Today's delicious pairing is all about the ultimate grilled steakhouse burger, which is fitting since today is National Grilling Day. The Singleton is an award-winning single malt scotch that's versatile enough to enjoy neat over ice or mixed in a cocktail. It's perfect for a refreshing summer beverage around the grill with friends, but before we get to that, we need to make some burgers. Let's get down to basics. Alright, so in pursuit of the ultimate steakhouse burger, we must start with the ultimate steakhouse burger bun. I'm starting off by combining 500 grams of bread flour, 7 grams instant yeast, 25 grams sugar, and 10 grams kosher salt in the bowl of a stand mixer, tiny whisking to combine, then adding 100 grams of whole milk and 200 grams of water, both heated to a tepid 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Affix dough hooks and get to kneading, just until the dough starts to come together and no dry spots remain. Then, one little piece at a time, we're adding 85 grams of very soft, unsalted butter, making sure that each piece is fully emulsified into the dough before adding the next. This is going to give our buns a rich brioche-like quality. After kneading for five or six minutes after the last piece of butter is added, you should end up with a soft, springy, silky dough that passes the windowpane test with flying colors, and is ready to be rolled into a smooth, taut ball, plopped back into the bowl from whence it came, maybe give it a little toss in the air for good, <laughs> for good luck, plopped in the bowl and covered with a plate where it's going to rise at room temperature for one hour hour until doubled in size. Now it is ready to be shaped into burger buns. This dough plays nicest on a well-oiled countertop, so go ahead and hit your work surface with a little bit of neutral flavored oil like vegetable or canola. And since we want six identical buns, we're going to weigh the whole batch of dough, divide that number by six, and weigh out six pieces that weigh exactly one-sixth of the whole batch of dough. You, you know what I'm trying to say. Stretch those into taut, smooth topped buns, which we're going to allow to rise for another 45 minutes to one hour on a parchment lined baking sheet. Pat each ball of dough down into a little disc so it's going to form more like a hamburger bun than a loaf of bread. And you can cover these guys with a clean kitchen towel. Or if you happen to have a proofing box, the exact width and height of your baking sheet, that will work too, probably very well. Go ahead and give those a rest for 45 minutes to one hour until they've poofed a bit, maybe grown by about 50%. We've got our oven preheated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, but before these boys go in the sauna, we're brushing them down thoroughly with a beaten egg yolk and optionally covering with a generous sprinkling of sesame seeds. Just make sure you do it quick because the egg dries pretty quickly and then they won't stick as well. Into the oven they go, 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 to 35 minutes, rotating halfway through until they emerge the most beautiful burger buns you've ever bunned. Allow these to cool completely before using in your favorite burger application. Next up on our bougie burger hit list is the caramelized onions. Two large Vidalia onions, thinly sliced into half rings, and slowly, gently cooked over medium, medium low heat, adding a little splash of water as necessary until they have formed a dark, impossibly rich, sweet and savory onion jam. The only condiment our burger is going to need because we care a lot about the meat. And here they are, a whole bunch of different cuts of cow that you might consider putting into a burger. We're going to focus more on the specific cuts of beef and what they bring to the party in an upcoming episode of Basics, the Smash Burger episode. But today we are decidedly splurging on dry-aged ribeye. A lot of folks might be very upset at my taking this beautiful ribeye and turning it into a burger, but that's really the only way we're going to make one of those amazing steakhouse burgers at home. Steakhouses dry age their own beef, which means they end up with lots and lots of dry aged scraps with which to make burgers. Our next best option is to grind up one very expensive piece of beef and cut it, so to speak, with the next best thing. We ground up seven different kinds of beef so we could taste them individually and come up with our favorite blends for smash burgers, regular burgers, and the steakhouse burger. Like I said, we'll hit smash burgers on a future episode, but for this one, as you may have guessed, the dry aged ribeye tasted far and away the best. So what we need is a similarly rich, flavorful beef that we can cut the mix with so we don't use as much ribeye, and for me, that was brisket. A 50-50 mix of both is going to make a fatty, buttery burger that's perfect to serve thick and medium rare. So there you have it, our very expensive but very delicious burger mix. Now comes the time to form patties, and these are going to be surprisingly, upsettingly huge. I'm going for 10 ounce patties. Again, steakhouses are all about excess, and their burgers are no exception. So pile them high and start patting them out 
into patties. A lot of you might be familiar with the divot method, pressing a deep divot into the center of your burger to compensate for any contraction that happens during the cooking process. You know, when you throw a burger on the grill and you end up with a meatball. But since we ground our own beef, that's not really necessary. I like to make them slightly thinner in the center than they are on the outsides, but overall they should keep their shape pretty well. Now for one last dash of decadence after I cut my buns in half, I'm gonna smear them with duck fat before toasting for an extra hit of richness. Again, totally optional, you could use butter and it'll still turn out really, really, really good. For cooking on the stove top, I like a nice flat cast iron griddle like this one, perfect for both toasting buns and searing patties. Patties that we're not seasoning with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper until the very last minute, right before they hit the griddle. Basically, you want to blast your burgers with as much heat as humanly possible until you've formed a nice crust on one side, give them a flip, and top them with cheese right before they're done cooking. How long it's going to take for them to cook depends on about a billion factors. The thickness of your beef, the power of your stove, your cat's emotional health. The only real ways to know are with a thermometer or with experience. You make a lot of burgers, you're going to start to know what the meat is supposed to feel and look like. I know that practice makes perfect is an annoying answer, but until that day comes that you're inside your burger's head, just get a thermometer. Anyway, we're plating up with a big smear of our caramelized onions, a couple slices of Munster cheese, and that's it. That's all this burger needs, except maybe the kiss of a flame. If you want to do this out on your grill, the rules are pretty much the same. Season generously with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper right before plopping on the hottest part of your grill. I like to keep my two left burners on full blast and my two right burners on medium-low flame. This gives you a nice hot place to sear the exterior of the burger and a cooler place where you can slowly cook it if you want to bring it up to temp and or toast your buns. Is this better than an indoor burger? Yeah, kind of. Mostly because you're not filling your kitchen with a cloud of smoke. But however you cook it, this ended up being the most delicious burger I've ever had. You might be wondering why I'm not loading it up with condiments and vegetables, and that's because this burger puts the emphasis on the beef. Munster is a very mild cheese that's adding texture more than anything else, and the caramelized onions only serve to add unctuousness to the juicy, beefy, beefy beef. In fact, all this burger really needs now is a bold, refreshing cocktail. One I'm gonna call the Rosemary's Babby. This starts fittingly enough with a sprig of rosemary being placed into a chilled coupe glass, over which we're gonna pour a quarter ounce of absinthe or chartreuse. Set that aside, and then in a cocktail shaker with ice, we are combining one and a quarter ounces of the Singleton 12, three quarters of an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice, and half an ounce of simple syrup. We're then going to shake rigorously for about 30 seconds. This chills, aerates, and lightly dilutes the cocktail. But before we strain it out, we're going to very carefully torch our rosemary. You don't have to use absinthe in this cocktail, but make sure you use something high proof enough that it sets our herbs alight. If a high proof spirit isn't available, you can always use dried rosemary and just torch it. Let that burn for a few seconds to get a nice smoky flavor, and then extinguish it with the strained contents of our shaker. And there you have it, the Rosemary's Babby, a smoky, punchy cocktail perfect for summer grilling, and all the rich, unctuous flavors of our steakhouse burgers in particular. And these cocktails and burgers are best when shared with friends, so here's Jess to give me a little help polishing things off. After all, this is like my third or fourth burger today, so really she's just looking out for my health. Thanks again to The Singleton for partnering with me on today's episode. The Singleton 12-year-old is perfect for newcomers to the world of Scotch whiskey. It's light, fruity, versatile, and mixes beautifully in a refreshing cocktail. Plus, tastes great on its own. There's really nothing better than enjoying a summer cocktail with friends at your next patio or backyard barbecue, so grab a few friends, a few ingredients, and a bottle of The Singleton at the link in the video description.